there, welcome to or welcome back to No Pants Profits. My name is Richard. I'm coming to you today from San Francisco, California, but more specifically in front of the California Academy of Sciences. Now, intrinsically, you would think something called the California Academy of Sciences is a science museum, but I do not believe they are an ASTC passport member. What that means is that my local science museum admission will get me in, but there's no reason not to try and kind of see if it'll do it. Um, this is one of the, it's a Smithsonian level museum from what I've heard. I think I've been here before many years ago, but I'm gonna go ahead and give you as full of a tour as I can. So jump along as we explore, or come along as we explore the California Academy of Sciences. See you inside. All right, so strangely, they are listed on the ASTC membership, but they're not an ASTC member, so they don't offer the reciprocal admission, so ta-da, but $51 later, tough pill to swallow. You can get on Groupon a little bit cheaper, but you gotta, you gotta buy it early. Um, we are in. I'm gonna give you as much of a tour as I can of everything that's going on here. That seems to just be a room for things and stuff. Um, but let us continue. We've got a gigantic dinosaur here. This does not seem to be original, but uh, let's see. This is right at the entrance. Again, it does not seem to be original. It is a, a gift. Yeah, something says that's not original. Those are castings. They look, uh, they look a little too be good. A little too good to be original. They've got VIP tours. Okay. VIP express entrance to the restaurant, earthquake simulator, ooh. All right. So let us look around. Oh my, that's the line right there just to get into the rainforest. Might be worth taking a VIP tour. The rainforest wraps like crazy. We won't go into it, but uh, good God, that line is a lot of bit crazy. They've got a dining pavilion here, but yeah, we're we're just getting in, and that uh, that line's already there. I think, I think we might uh, get the VIP tour. I'm just talking out loud. Uh, also, very strangely, this whole section seems to be closed. I'm just looking at the lines right here. I'm about to make the decision to, uh, to, to do the VIP tour before I go on and before it sells out because that looks like it's a 45 minute line into the rainforest plus the planetarium plus everything else so um yeah guys then don't come here on a saturday <laughs> that's just when i happen to come here but i'm gonna go see if i can get a ticket to the uh, the vip tour because i think that's the only way i'm gonna get anything done here in a reasonable amount of time i'll be back with you in just a moment but it seems like seems like <laughs> the VIP tour is the absolute way <laughs> to go because um, that gets you that gets you one tour uh, express to the rainforest earthquake simulator planetarium yeah I'm gonna get a VIP tour and I'll be back with you because I'm not waiting in these lines with all these people today. Sorry, $26 is worth my time. All right, so I'm gonna let you know, this is an efficiency thing with anything else. It's just like you went to Disney or somewhere, bought a fast pass, 26 on top of the 51, but it'll get us uh, guaranteed access. Do you need that? Are you good? I already have my, my wristband, okay. So it, again, it gets you an hour of VIP tour, ages eight and up, 10% off shopping and dining. VIP express entrance to the Rainforest, Earthquake Simulator, and Planetarium. So, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna go on a, on a little tour, which is kind of cool. I guess we're gonna see Spark the Universe in us and then tour the universe. Uh, but yeah, we don't have to wait in any of these lines for the rainforest or anything like that. It's just, I already saw what the rainforest line looked like. 
um, he saw what the rain forest line looked like too. So this is a, uh, a game of efficiency to pack as much in as possible. So we're going to take a little tour, um, hopefully see a lot of the museum, and um, see you there. We're, we're skipping three lines for less than $10 a line. I thought that worked. Stick around. Tour starts in just one side. Right from the big old fake old, I think, dinosaur, right where it says VIP tour. So you get this little badge, which I guess is what gets you the fast pass for uh, priority access to the Rainforest Earthquake Simulator and Planetarium. Then you just return this before you leave. Maybe. Just saying. Return this before you leave. Maybe. We'll see if they take it from us. Or it may have some value. We'll see. All right, so we are actually, um, I didn't know what the behind the scenes tour was, but I'm finding out now. It gives you priority access to the planetarium and the, all right, we're gonna take the, we're gonna take the stair goers. But yeah, it gives us access there, but we're gonna see a bunch of stuff that normal people wouldn't see. So uh, that's a bonus. So you get to follow along. I'll show you some short little clips here and there. They said, you know, extended video recording, maybe drop in some photos and stuff like that. But again, it does also get you earthquake simulators over there in that closed section, but it will get us into the planetarium. No problem. Uh, it will get us into the uh, rainforest with no waiting. So that's a good benefit plus. We're going to see behind the scenes, so um, you definitely can see that. That was 26 bucks, but I don't want to wait 40 minutes to get into the planetarium and 40 minutes to get into the um, to get into the rainforest. So, so badge right here is going to help us. So we'll be in here after the tour. I'll show you the whole rainforest and not have to wait in that long line. I guess we are starting where, I always like to start museums all the way at the top and work my way down. This is the living roof. We are still in the um, gen pop area per se. Welcome to Ooh. the living room, everyone. Now, looks like a hobbit house. Oh my. Research looks like. Uh, when I open the gate, it makes a little bit of an alarm. But do not worry because we are not breaking any rules. Uh, we are a tour group out there, so you do not need to pay attention to that alarm noise. So follow me up. All right. So I think we're about to go through an alarm. This is VIP tours only. Oh, really? That's an alarm. So we are now going in where we should be. Oh no! These two pieces are animal bones. These two bones together make up the lower jaw of a sperm whale, a large type of toothed whale. You can sort of imagine the skull. This is the lower half right over here. Now you may be wondering why there are bones on the roof to begin with. Out of every place in the building, on the rooftop seems like not maybe the first thing you think of. Um, eventually they do get stored downstairs into a room which we will see later on on this tour. But the reason why we have bones on a roof is because this is where our scientists clean and dry them long term. Mm. Now the way that happens is, we have a team of scientists here that are part of what's called the Marine Mammal Stranding Network. And they're a group of folks who are basically keeping a watch out along our coastlines, our beaches, shores, all along the state of California. Now when there is a dead whale that washes up, our scientists get a phone call and they go out to investigate and they can dissect into the animal and take out bones and other samples for research in the building. Now the large bones that they take are brought directly from the coast to the roof. So when these bones first got here, they were not yet research ready. They still had skin, some muscle, some bone marrow still attached to the bone. I know not the best mental picture, um, but we had to clean them off and make them ready for the laboratories in the future. So what we did was our scientists, they took the bones, buried them under the soil and left them down there for around four years. During that time, which is quite a long time, all the insects and other decomposers within the soil slowly eat away at the tissue on the bone, eat away at that bits of skin, the muscle, the bone marrow, and clean the bone by eating everything off of it. So it does take a long time because remember these are very small and rather slow moving um, insects and other decomposers, but they're also very thorough. So after around four years, uh, the bones are dug up and they are basically picked clean, but we're only halfway done with the procedure because we need to dry these bones out next. 
so the bones are left in the open air like this to dry for another four years on average. It's a long time that these bones are up here, and the reason why the drying takes so long is because whale bones by nature have a lot of moisture trapped deep within the bone tissue, a lot of different bodily fluids and oils in there that we need to dry out completely because if the bone is still slightly wet inside and we store it away too soon, it gets moldy, which means we can't use it for research because it's a big problem. So we want to be really sure that these bones are as dried out as possible before we then bring them inside to where the other specimens are stored. And again, we'll see a room like that later on in the tour where you'll get a sense of how we store specimens in the building. Um, now you may be wondering, a sperm whale has teeth, but where are the teeth on these jaw bones? They have no teeth in them. Well, the teeth aren't missing, they weren't lost in any way. We have removed them ahead of time for research purposes. Mm. And the reason why we removed them was because, is because if there are small bones like teeth up here, they can easily fall out over time. And because we do a lot of uh, movement of soil, um, gardening work, um, bones like that can get lost. And also, in the rare instance, there are red-tailed hawks which nest in the trees which can fly down, and I think it's happened in the past, they have actually s sort of picked up a small bone and flew away with it, which is very frustrating for a scientist to, you know, a bird taking your work. And, I mean, so they want to avoid that. So what we do is we... <laughs> <laughs> what we do is we take the bones out ahead of time and they send them down to a lower laboratory where they have colonies of dermestid beetles. Dermestid beetles are also known as flesh-eating beetles. Again, sorry for that unpleasant mental image. But these beetle colonies will clean off the small bones by eating away the tissue just like the insects up here. So they're a great solution for any small, delicate bone which we can't really have up here for the eight years or so. so that's why the teeth are not in the jawbone, but they are stored in the museum. Any questions about that entire procedure? Yes. Great question. Mold, and we actually have had bones sent to us which have had some mold on them in the past. What we do is if it has mold, we will bring it up here to dry it out so we can still air dry on the roof because it's not surrounded by other, you know, specimens close by. We can put it in its own area. We'll still dry it out. The problem with a moldy bone is even if you dry the mold off, it still is damaged because of the mold growth. It's a little bit scarred, it's a little bit worn out. So they'll likely not use it for active research, but they might store it away just for record keeping. Yeah, so if it gets sent to us like that, it's not the biggest problem in the world, but there are limitations with how we use it. Kind of cool. Up here on the roof, you've got uh, two different hills, and that one's the rainforest, and then the far one, there's the planetarium. We're going to be inside of those later, but instead of building like a five or six story building, they built a three story building, and they have these things protruding out the top. Um, this is all a live garden area right up here. Again, we're, that is the normal museum area, and then this is the uh, extended one. We'll go through this, and then we'll go through the actual museum, and we'll see if it's worth the price. But I think it's worth the price just for the skip the line alone. All right, so now we are uh, walking in the living garden, and there's more whale bones up here. But now we are uh, well off the uh, beaten path here, and they're showing how they air dry those whale, whale bones and they can study humpback migration patterns from those whale bones. This group is up to 12 people. I think we're nine right now. Animals are an important part of the ecosystem around us and really help out those animals. And our scientists really love to work hard to maintain this garden. Even though you may notice uh, little dry patches here and there, not a big issue. Um, California native plants naturally will have periods where they're greener and then periods where they die back. So this is totally normal. This is a very drought tolerant garden in general, which helps us save a lot of water. Um, also, the roof helps us with temperature control on the public floor. The public floor has no air conditioning or heating system. It's all uh, entirely natural. Um, the way we cool down is in the center of these hills, above the piazza rooftop, there are open hatches which allows cool air to funnel in and sort of go throughout the building. So the building always airs itself out. It never gets really too stuffy. On the flip side, if it gets really cold out here, the building inside doesn't really reflect that because a green roof is a very good natural insulator. So body heat and things like that are packed in really well because of the soil and the plants. So save a lot of power that way. 
Oh, that rope over there? That rope is used by the engineers if they need to work on things up at the top of the hill or if they're maybe sort of uh, looking at any of those circular hatches, because those hatches actually open and close, but if there's a trouble, there's trouble with one of them, we have to have engineers go up. And it can be a little steep, so they sometimes use that for support. So they open and close to let different humidities and stuff into the rainforest? Uh, not to the, so that I think would, theori would be the theoretically used if we need to sort of like air the entire building. Oh, I think okay. the reason why is because it's above the rainforest, oh, okay. they don't really open it that often because we don't want to actually disrupt that sort of the conditions in the rainforest. So that maintains right. itself. It doesn't really need the outside. It's its own yes. biome. Yeah, exactly. okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. The humidity, the temperature, that is sort of, that is controlled in there. And I think opening this too often could throw it off balance a little bit, though I'm not sure if there's sort of a... If there's a layer? If there's a layer of protection. So this, that sunlight doesn't get through to the rainforest, right? The sunlight, the sunlight oh, it does. I think does, but I'm not sure if there are layers which would protect any, anything else, like theoretically it, other insects or birds right. coming in. There may be a protection. Because those are, that's a South African rainforest, or what, what is that? Um, not South, South American, I mean. Yeah, yeah, that's I a South it, American yeah, rainforest, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no worries. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be my after, uh, after South American rainforest. Um, so with all the plants. And, and you like, can't let anything out that's in there either. Exactly. So that's, that's why the more, the more I think about it, the more I, like, almost positive there are protective layers because if we were to open those, we don't want, like, those butterflies flying out to the park right. because then it starts to about. Then they're an invasive out. species and all that fun, right, exactly. funness like that. And now we are headed actually behind the scenes. This is kind of uh, where the museum ends and the stuff you can't normally see begins. So, no. yeah. I will show you, I will show you what I can here. I don't know how much I can really show you. But then we're gonna go do the real museum after. I'm showing you this in real time, real order. So, yeah. This is a specimen room. Straight ahead. And, you know, open the door slowly. Contact information. I suppose you can look at them. Oh, wow. I'll let you know in a minute. This room belongs to our ichthyology department. And ichthyology is the scientific study of fish. So as you probably already noticed, you are seeing only fish specimens in these jars. And this entire room from end to end specializes in just fish. And this department is a big one. This department has four rooms like this. So across all four rooms, it's estimated there are around 2.2 million individual fish stored and logged in the database, which is a huge amount to say the least. A lot of people wonder why we need over 2 million fish in just one building. What can we possibly use all that for? It's a good thing to wonder. I wondered that myself in the very beginning. What we do is we use a lot of this for our current research, um, a lot of genetics research. You probably go study the genome, the DNA, um, but we also save these specimens for other researchers, scientists, and students around the world to come with us and work with our specimens. Uh, we are basically like a library of life that they can utilize to complete their own work. So that's why we um, store so much and store it for as long as possible, because who knows what these could be used for in the future. We want to be ready for any type of research. So the fancy glass toppers were collected um, in December of 1883 from Cuba, making them the oldest jars I've currently found in this shop space here. Now, a little bit about the liquid they're all stored in. We nowadays use um, um, two different chemicals to store, ethanol or isopropyl alcohol. And those are chemicals which are really good at preserving the physical shape of the fish, as well as the DNA within the cells. DNA is essentially the blueprint of life. Um, inside each of the cells in every living organism's body. Um, we used to use a different chemical called formalin, which was formaldehyde in, in more of a liquid form. That was no longer used for a long time now because it corrupts the DNA, so the DNA gets destroyed and falling apart in formalin, and also it's a cancer risk for scientists. Mm -hmm. So from a health standpoint, uh, that is no longer a chemical. But there's still used. multiple here that have formaldehyde in them because they're so old, correct? They would have had, they, that's true. Um, and because they were in there for so long, they had to be, um, they can't be used for genetics research, but right. everything here in formalin was actually emptied out and replaced with alcohol. Oh, okay. Yeah, so a long undertaking there. All the older jars which still have formalin, which they sometimes, a research practice they do is they still will briefly soak in formalin right. before long-term ethanol. Those are stored in different rooms. Oh, okay. Yeah. A lot of duplicates. Um, these are sent to us sometimes from fishing boats. You know, those fishing vessels have their really big nets and sometimes they catch up um, maybe more fish than they need or fish of the incorrect species, which they can't use for their work, so they can send to us instead. So this I want to point out. This jar, many fish here, these are all flat fish or flounders, no eyes on the side of their body, both eyes are on the other side. 
Um, and that murkier jar in the left corner over there mm. has fish uh, with flat heads, you'll notice. Those fish are remoras, and remoras will sometimes stick to the underbellies of sharks, using that flat top as essentially a suction cup. And they do that because sharks leave behind a lot of fish. So interesting. We're in, we're in rooms like this, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, the main exhibit floor is only 3% of the collection they have. 97% of the collection they have is in rooms right like this. Well, spotfin porcupine fish collected um, in 1954 from Micronesia didn't come to the academy until the 1960s. Now, if you look closely, you'll see the mouth and eyes up in the corner over there, give you a sense of how the specimen is stored. Um, and these fish, you know, will inflate like a large spiky balloon, in a sense, to defend themselves. And they can only inflate when they're alive. So if it were to inflate, it would actually almost double in size. Don't know how they got it when they did. But yeah, folks, so if we just shuffle around so that everybody gets a good chance to take a sort of look at this from a good angle. An angler fish, which is the, uh, the, the deep sea fish uh, with the little light the on its head. And the light is there to so, attract a uh, smaller fish than the angler fish. The angler get the fish angler fish, fish come, coming okay. our way. Okay. You'll notice on the label that this was collected in 1942, accidentally, by a fishing net. So lucky they saved it. It. And it shouldn't have been at that level of the sea. No, so it died in the deep sea and slowly floated up, probably through upwelling sort of currents. Um, so yeah, a lot of sort of remarkable luck led the specimen to get to us. So because that's probably a rare specimen to have. Yes. Because you don't rare? most of the stuff in the deep sea just dies and it falls into the it deep stays, sea. It stays exactly. It stays on the Is that very, the rarest one. Yes, I would say the rarest, at least in this room. Um, but yeah, you see the the dark blue tip right there. I thought it was just made up in cartoons, that fish. That's right, yeah, like Finding Nemo. By the way, and, yeah. That's actually probably a female. That's right, I think you may know that, you probably because, know the story, right? Because males are hundreds of times smaller than females. And males, fish. Wow. I'm pretty sure males don't, don't have the light either. That's exactly right. So, I don't know if everybody cool. heard, but what you said was... Well, we are up on the catwalk above the uh, California, uh, California Science Museum, and there's a white alligator here and someone just goes see that alligator and albino alligator they go why doesn't that alligator ever move why doesn't he uh, why doesn't he move why doesn't he do anything well because he's just fed every single day he just sits there and does nothing all day and you might say hey rich what do you call that yeah that's white privilege well albino privilege well white alligator privilege so yes in California, if you're an albino alligator, white privilege is still a thing. So folks, welcome to our dry collection room. So right off the bat, we have two open shop spaces down here. If you want to take a look down there, uh, you are more than welcome to do so. Just a couple things I want to quickly go over. Uh, first off, like the last room, please make sure not to touch, move, or rotate anything in this room, and to make sure to keep uh, photos to the non-flash right away photography only. Uh, next up, go the back, just make sure it doesn't knock into any of the uh, protruding sort of taxidermies or horns or antlers. Uh, they don't want to leave their back in the center, you're more than welcome to, or if you want to keep it on you, that's fine as well. Um, but folks, have a look around. We'll read down in the center when I add, and then I'll talk to you about the central slides. Okay, leave it right here. Yeah, it's totally fine. So. This room, as you see, has not just a lot of bones, but a lot of animal taxidermies along the walls here. These taxidermies have not been made by the Academy. These are actually all donations from private estates and lodges. They would have been part of people's personal collections. The Academy itself has not done a research uh, for, uh, the, has not done a taxidermy for research since I believe the 1950s. So it's not really something that's done and it's not to be researched anymore. The zebra taxidermy is an unusual specimen because it was actually confiscated from San Francisco Airport in 2018 by some folks who were trying to smuggle this through the airport to illegally sell somewhere in the U.S. Obviously they failed because not only is that incredibly illegal, but it's a really big taxidermy to try and hide in an airport. Remember those whale bones drying out on the roof earlier? Well, there's where they put them when they're nice and dry and that one looks like it's got some mold on it i'm just saying or or it was a barbecue rib um what you see there's the whale bones right there got antlers so many antlers more antlers more antlers more antlers and more antlers, and more antlers. Oh on the box over here we have an elephant skull top and bottom half here of an elephant 
named Babe, who lived in the zoo from 1924 until 1965. What's this one I heard this one was an alpha named Penny. That's what, and that's what I remember, so I think it's, yeah. There's a Pokemon character. Oh, yeah? Oh. What, what, is it a more recent character? If you know me when I'm on cruise ships, I'm not a fan of children. Yeah. And you'll see, this is basically a, uh, a child there. A little, little monkey child. It's in the storage collection of the California Academy of Sciences. But yeah, there's a, it's actually pretty cool. Uh, we're here on a behind the scenes tour. And yes, we've got a juvenile monkey, which I'm happy it's not alive because it'd be as, just as annoying as uh, actual juveniles. But uh, I like it in its skeleton form. I wish most kids would come that way. That's all I'm saying. Let the kids come like the monkey. Then they just stay still. They don't make noise or anything like that. Let the kids come like the monkey. At B12, you want to envision in your mind is like a large dolphin or a porpoise, which is around 30 feet long on average. So they're quite large animals. This skull is from B12. Actually, I'm going to open it and show you while I'm talking. Come no take a look. This skull was from a B12 that washed up along the shore of Santa Cruz in 1925. It was known at the time as the Santa Cruz Sea Monster. <laughs> I know, pretty fancy name, right? The reason why they called it Sea Monster was because when it washed up, the head was separated from the body and the skin and muscles stretched out to make it look like it had a long neck. But of course it didn't have a neck. Folks at the time, though, didn't really know what they had found, so they got a little fanciful and called it the Sea Monster of Santa Cruz. And actually, I think some of them have actually thought it was an example, like a deep sea beast. Um, but it was used to help drum up tourism for the area. It was a pretty popular tourist exhibit. And it was there for a while. Oh, so it was on the beach, like, as a freak show yeah, kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. I, think they, I don't know if they moved some of the boats to, like, where the boardwalk is or something like that. Um, but it was one of those sort of, like, attraction wow. exhibits for a while. Um, eventually, they stored the bones away, and they were properly identified as beaked whale bones. All right, so it looks like now we're headed down towards the aquarium, but I don't think to the aquarium. We got one more stop on the VIP tour, which was a mineral exhibit. But yes, we are in the Steinhardt Aquarium. Hopefully we'll come back down here later. Got a southern swamp. Hey, that's where I'm from. Um, southern swamp. Florida, oh, there. There's our white privilege gator. Didn't catch him earlier. But we've got an on the floor, off the floor place we're going to now. So right through the aquarium. Well, to the vault. Welcome to the vault, everyone. Ooh. So, I'm going to stop this and turn on low light. specimen collection room for These are display pieces sent to us over the many years from various uh, donors, collectors, perhaps uh, geologists as well. Um, so this is what I just started. So please take a laugh and take a look. We have some rare specimens in here. Um, you know, we have the gold in the Central California cabinet over there. A uh, rare piece of rose quartz is in the, the pink cabinet at the corner over there. The half ring of rose quartz on smoky quartz, which is called Haley's Comet rose quartz. Oh. But uh, feel free to keep exploring. Room? And if you have any questions, please ask me. Again, we will be in here for the next four to five minutes. Um, and yeah, round 12.05 is when we will officially wrap up the tour. Yes. What is the most common gem? Probably the quartz, the, the quartz variants in here. Quartz is pretty common. Yeah. common one. You do? Oh, I, I have a dining. I have a dining table made out of quartz. A quartz? Really? A quartz? That's really cool. Oh my gosh! And is it big? That's and awesome. Yeah, marble. Yeah, Mar Marvel's also very cool. That VIP tour was really quite good. I am going to keep you on camera now as long as I can. I was told we finished in that private mineral room, which is just like meant for the VIP tour. No one else even goes there. It literally says VIP on the door. I am now going to use this badge, which I will be returning at the end of my day. I got friends, huh? So, I was told to go to the rainforest first, then take the elevator down to the aquarium, and then we'll see the planetarium. There's our alligator. It's almost hard to see him. Almost. There we go. And uh, I'm gonna stop the recording for just a second so I can turn off low light. 
And then we're gonna go to the rainforest. Are you lazy? Do you wanna sit around all day and do next to nothing and get fed and have people take photos of you because you're really famous? Well, if you are, come to the California Academy of Sciences. Because guess what they've got? They've got an albino alligator here. You might say, what do you mean if you're lazy albino alligator? I say, look, albino alligator. He has no natural predators or anything come after him. And he just sits here all day, gets fed, does nothing, and visitors love him. We're in California and there's something that does exist here. Yeah, see that albino alligator sitting there chilling, eating all that stuff for free? That's white privilege. That's all I'm saying. All right, I'm back and let's go to the rainforest of the world. Again, there's this uh, donors and tours entrance. There for donors and VIP tour guests. Reservation or tour badge. Hey, look, we got it. You guys ready to go see? I've also got my little 360 mast right there. So we're gonna skip the uh, 25, 30 minute line that's on the other side and just uh, enter right here. So you'll see, we got a line right here. Hi, oh, just Yep. I like your hat. Thank you. We got a line right here that we're gonna jump on by. There are no bathroom facilities inside the rainforest. Um, we got the 360 going back there. So we're gonna get in in just a moment's time and I'll get back with you. All right, thank you very much. And we're going, oh, we're in an airlock. Stay off of that, because that's, that's the door path, right? I'm saying I need to stay off of that and we all need to stay off of that, because that's the door path. Like yeah, okay. All right, here we go. All right, everyone. So really quickly, exit at the top, the leading food is fine. No pushing butterflies. If you take photos, go flash photography, okay? Yep. Alrighty. And we've gone through that little airlock, and we are in the rainforest. <laughs> Yeah, we're back in Miami. We are back in friggin' Miami. There is humidity like nobody's business here in the rainforest. That's what I'm gonna say. Let's walk around, let's see. We got a little bit of time before our planetarium reservation. There are bats in the belfry. Ah, ah, ah. Wait, no, are they actually bats there? No, this is bullshit. Oh, they look stuffed bats. I was really confused. I was like, that's way too light for normal bats. They seem to be cleaning out the rainforest. So yeah, this is a self-contained biome of sorts. Water drives life. And I guess, the only way out is up. So let's go ahead, let's go through the rainforest. We can discover the canopy. Oh, okay. So you can discover the understory and the forest floor. They seem to just be pipes that point up, down, and straight ahead. Um, they got macaws somewhere here. Okay, they should be hanging out. Oh, there's some macaws. Those are about five grand a piece. Says a guy who knows some bird store people. Well, let's go ahead and let us head up. Yeah, this is how you visit South Florida in California. It was so nice and cool in the museum. The museum actually uses no active air conditioning, which is kind of a, a random fact of life. Um, so it uses no active air conditioning. Unfortunately, the California exhibit it's closed uh, through the end of May, they said. Opens at the end of May, or else we could go on the earthquake simulator. Uh, look at that. That's amazing, actually. Like, this is a living biome. That is a big, ugly spider right there. You can see them working on. Oh, that's a spider exhibit. I thought it was just random that there were big, ugly spiders here. No, they put the big, ugly spider here. 
but there's no glass or anything because we are in the cage. Closest thing I've done to this is, uh, there was this place back in Miami back in the day called Monkey Jungle. And in Monkey Jungle, you would uh, go through the monkey cage, but you were in the cage with the monkey. This is similar. So yeah, this is, uh, I see some birds flying. Oh, I see butterflies. That's a real, butter That's a real butterfly. Those are just plants. I see butterflies, I see fish, I see people that have jackknifed their stroller so you can't get through. Oh, small friggin' chimpanzee children. That's what I call all children. Oh, well, yeah. Remember those uh, circles up on the roof earlier? That's the roof, that's where the light's coming in. The butterflies are up there on the top level. You should actually see them flying around there. All right. Oh, got to recenter the camera because it went chasing butterflies. Shows you some of the different animals here. But I think this is one of the largest, if not the largest rainforest biome in the world that's, you know, not the, you know, actual rainforest. Um, but i got to find my way up. I think we're going to go back this way to go up. I like to tour. There wasn't many kids on it. Um, we got to go up to get out. So I think this is the up to get out space. Now we're going to go down, check out the aquarium. Then we go to the planet Arium. And then we'll be finished. Oh, you can eat less meat. Focus on forests. Heart and lungs worth protecting. So yeah, this whole thing has a self-contained structure right here. We can walk around the structure. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the earthquake simulator. Now we can see it from a higher level or maybe that's, there's an earthquake simulator somewhere back there, but they seem to be doing a refurb on the uh, California section of this museum. Oh yeah, as we're going up. Oh, there we go. There's some butterflies and stuff. You should be there. You should be able to see there. Ah, yeah, you can definitely see some butterflies. My preview screen is about the size of a postage stamp. So I can't see if you can really see it. And you can see there is the rainforest up there kind of spilling out the rain. No, there are no, no elephants in here. Only the elephant skulls that we saw earlier. Uh-oh. California's trying to judge me. Bad idea, California. Just because you said eat less meat, I'm going to eat more meat. There's some butterflies. Let me zoom in real quick. If you really love butterflies, you should definitely check out Butterfly World in Florida. Taylor Swift joke. Oh my god, the butterflies are all over. Please do not touch the butterflies. Excuse me. So I guess right now we are waiting for an elevator. Let's see. We've got butterflies like crazy. Please don't touch them. But uh, we're waiting for an elevator to go down. So. I think everyone here is waiting, so I'm gonna have to uh, catch you on the bottom because I don't wanna just stand in the elevator line with you forever. So this is a massive failure and a massive bottleneck here, unless these elevators are absolutely massive, which maybe they might be. They have one of their two ways out out of service. I'm sweating like crazy because I feel like I'm back in South Florida. This is like 100 degree rainforest in here. Um, I'm gonna see how many more people they can squeeze into that elevator. Yeah. We'll be on the we'll be on the next elevator. But um, yeah, there's some butterflies, some more butterflies, some more butterflies. So yeah, exit aquarium and oh god, the butterflies are in 3D. So, Muppet fishing show. Yeah, there's some. 
3D butterflies. 3D butterflies. But uh, yeah, one, one working elevator. One working elevator. And oof, nearly 100% humidity. This does not feel like California that I know. I want to talk about one of the dumbest operational things I've ever seen. I'm at the uh, California Academy of Sciences. Oh, is that a butterfly that was trying to hitchhike on me? Oh God. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to leave the rainforest exhibit. Uh, and in leaving the rainforest exhibit, they have a single elevator that gets you out. No stairs or anything like that. Uh, not the uh, not the smartest way out, but there's the there's the butterfly guard, right? You're making sure no butterflies get on the elevators. Exactly. So that's the butterfly guard. Yeah, come on in, come on in. But this is the only way out, and we're going from 100% humidity. Uh, if you want to press the AQ button. AQ, okay. There we go. So we're headed down to the aquarium. I feel the humidity dropping. That is from 97% humidity back to a nice 30% uh, California humidity. When this door opens, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a very nice thing. Unfortunately, there's no VIP way to get out of the rainforest here. So it seems like um, this is we have to get in here. It's an airlock. We're still not out of the uh, we're still not out of the humidity. We're still not out of Florida yet. Once that door closes. Huh? Harder, right? Yeah, these signs are awful. <laughs> also, they shouldn't take you into a 100% humidity environment. I understand it's a rainforest. Come on, open, but, open, open. So, when it says exit aquarium, does it mean... Exit to the aquarium. There we go. To, oh my god, the humidity's back to normal. Oh, that was awful. I felt like I went back to Miami early. I really felt like I went back to Miami early. That was awful. Uh, uh, okay. We got flooded Amazon. Some other stuff like that, and there's a giant. This is in all of their marketing. This is the big tunnel. This has got fish vagina. Sorry, I'm gonna show you fish vagina. Oh my god, I'm adjusting to the fact that you can visit Florida inside of California. <laughs> if you just go down to the rainforest. Oh my god. There's no air conditioning here, as we learned earlier. It's all naturally ventilated. But thank God I'm not in that damn rainforest anymore. It's not like it's... All right. Oh. I am so relieved to be in here now. Oh, scorpions. All right. So, we got the California coast. And there's a whole section, for some reason, called Venom. And I think this has a venomous animal. Totally does. Sea anemones. Little baby pufferfish? No. No. Oh, these are iPads. And you could choose Filipino, but isn't that just Tagalog? So yeah, this is a whole venomous exhibit. Let's see what else we've got. Is that a, is that a platypus? I don't think that is a platypus. Need a picture of the platypus. I didn't mean to flash photography that. All right. See what else we got. Friggin' children on leashes. Deep reefs. And we've got more, uh, more of this right here. Got some more reefs. This is a giant aquarium. And inside of the aquarium is actually the planetarium. So the planetarium sits inside the aquarium. Kind of a uh, cool, a random fact. And now we're going to the Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone, Twilight Zone, Twilight Zone. It's kind of dark here. I don't know how much you're gonna be able to see. You can see these. No photos, please, because they're afraid of. Twilight Zone, Twilight Zone, Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone, Twilight Zone, Twilight Zone. Okay. Bioluminescence. 
and that's why that's all. Why that's all. We got some feces. Got a scuba diver. Let's see what else we can see. We've got uh, approximately uh, 12 minutes till we've got to be at the planet planetarium. Ooh, that looks like a place where they do big shows and stuff here on the sea life. There's like seating and stuff. Oh yeah. There's a big old... That's actually the one thing I actually do remember from this museum is this, uh, this look right here. Also, excuse me. Just stop for no reason. We got a hidden reef. Other things like that. If you are a fish person, I don't really like watching them or eating them. It's not a, not a fish person. But if you are a fish person, hey, that could be for you. Um, got a little bit more to head up because we got to head up to the planetarium in a couple minutes time. You could spend all day here if you weren't on the schedule. But I am on a schedule. We got some other stuff to check out though in the next uh, 10 minutes. Let's say hello again to our albino alligator friend. Love him. He's my favorite. Hi, dear. We got some other stuff. Here's a model of the actual museum. There's a lot more flowers. Oh, it's a Lego model. There's a lot more flowers than we were up there earlier. But you'll see, that's the path and the gate that we went down earlier. Where we saw, there's no bones drying out there. But I don't know if that Lego has bones. That would dry out there. So you do have to reserve the planetarium shows. But I've got a planetarium show actually reserved already. The question is, what more is there to see? We saw the bottom of the aquarium, but um, we do need to see the top of the aquarium. So this is the top of the aquarium, not the bottom of the aquarium, is right here. This is where divers enter and stuff like that. This is the uh, topmost point of the large section of the aquarium and the planetarium. Oh, I was just water sloshing around. The planetarium is right here. Yes, with reservations for the next show time only. Where's this entrance? Is this here as well? On the other side? Okay, thank you. So we got a couple more minutes until that. So, oh, it's like a Domino's game. Huh? They put up all these, uh, they look like sticks or pencils or something. And as the earth rotates throughout the day, it knocks down the different sticks. It's kind of an archaic way, I would say, to tell time. But that's, uh, yeah, it's a falcon pendulum. pendulum. Proof that the earth spins. I'm with the peg fall. Breaks down a peg every 30 to 45 minutes. Makes a complete circle in about 39 hours. Pendulum ball weighs 240 pounds. Um, does gravity alone know perpetual energy is a lie? Gravity alone does not keep it swinging indefinitely. An electromagnetic ring helps it swing constantly. Without it, friction to stop its motion. So yeah, you've got an electromagnetic ring. That's keeping it moving. We got a couple it's other indoor and outdoor exhibits. I heard there's penguins here. There's an African hall somewhere that has penguins. I do want to find that. Let's see. We're moving, we're moving, we're moving, we're moving. I heard there's an African hall that has penguins in it. So I do want to find the penguins. Stories, okay. Okay. There's some. There's some giraffe puffs. Giraffe puffs mean that there might be penguins 
Oh, here we go, African Hall. This is where the penguins are gonna be. And then this is where we need to be literally uh, seven minutes from now to enter into the planetarium show. And they also have a lot of science exhibits where people can touch the jaws of sharks and stuff like that. But this is the African Hall. This is very uh, Smithsonian in nature. It's actually a relative of mine. It's my old grandmother. It ate my baby. That's a dingo. Dingo ate my baby. That's similar to the chimp we saw downstairs. It's actually weird, you know how they're talking about a climate controlled kind of thing. That's similar. Oh, that, oh there penguins are here and they are real. So yeah, this is the Great African Hall. There's a little chimpy chimpy. I think that's not like a stuffed chimp. I don't think they use stuffed animals there. I think it's just a model of chimp. And baboon. Yeah, fast fact. Might be a stuffed baboon. Not really used for research purposes when it's stuffed because all the DNA and everything that's making its originals gone. But how this how this place differs from the Smithsonian, or well, at least the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. Oh, evil cheetah. How it differs from the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History is in their African hall, they do have one set of live African animals. And that is the penguins. So we got zebras and scimitar horned oryx. Wait, maybe, Let's see if that's, no. Are those scimitar horned oryx? No. Those are just gazelle. What are they? Have I ridden the ride? The yeah, animal kingdom enough. Birds, grasslands. Doesn't actually tell me what they No, those are gazelle. I think those are scimitar horned oryx. Doesn't really tell me what they are. No. It's just show me birds and stuff like that. Common named. Scientific name. It's an onyx. Hmm. Oryx. I'm, I'm gonna go with him. But the penguins. So they do penguin feedings at 10:30 and 3. But you'll see they have actual live penguins here. Now I like what uh, SeaWorld did with this a lot better with the exhibit you can go with the penguins, but there's there's a penguin. They love attention. I think they think they're gonna get fish. I think they think they're gonna get fish. I think these are African penguins, so it's not freezing cold in there. It's not Arctic weather, but yes, they are actual real life living penguins in their African. Oh, he's coming back. He's coming back for a photo. Come on back. Come on back. There you go. Oh, yeah. Oh. Are you there? You happy? You happy? You know it, flap your wings. If you're happy and you know it, flop your wings. If you're happy and you know it, oh, you know it. No, he's not really that happy. He flapped his wings. He's just bobbing up and down. Bob, 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 bob. He's busting his butt. All right. So we saw the penguins. We saw all that. There's a lot here to see. This is like the Exploratorium. It's a lot busier than uh, one would uh, initially expect it to be. I'm glad I was able to uh, actually see the rainforest. The only way I was able to do that and see the planetarium is because I got this VIP tour booked. So it looks like the last planetarium show seems to be getting out right now. Or people are just backing up for no reason. But it's time for me to jump in to the planetarium, see the planetarium show. And then uh, once we do that, we will definitely wrap it up right out here. So I'll see you right after the planetarium show, which we're gonna jump into in a second. Oh. Should be able to just jump in right here. Okay, we're just waiting for the next show to start. There's the stingray pool. They have one of those too. And it looks like the planetarium 
is about to open. Maybe I'll see you inside just to show you what it looks like if it's, uh, there's enough light in there to give you an idea what it looks like. This is a uh, pretty damn big planetarium. Oof. Cardio. Not your friend. I always like the center all the way to the back. But I'll show you. Just the pure size of all this. I have a planetarium. Very similar to this. That's actually by my, uh, at my museum that I'm a member of, which is an ASTC passport member, which they don't do here. I guess this museum's a little too much of a destination when they don't do it. We're gonna watch this planetarium show and we'll wrap it up outside. How my thoughts about the Science Center, the VIP tour, and everything like that. All right, uh, so that about uh, wraps it up here from the California Academy of Sciences. Do I think that the, uh, the tool, look, there's a big old orca. Well, it's not that big for killer whale. Do I think that the uh, added expense of the VIP tour was worth it? Yeah, I really do. I think it would have take, taken another, uh, we've been here for three hours, seen everything. I think it would have taken another two hours or more of just waiting in line, waiting for planetarium shows to become open and other stuff like that. Is there a lot more here I didn't show you? Yeah, that's here as well. But just as a wrap up, so this is Richard from No Pants Profit saying, yeah, you know what? It's probably worth splurging that 26 bucks, taking that VIP tour. You get to go to the roof. You get to go in all the private collections and stuff like that. And uh, you also get to do things a lot more efficiently. This is Richard from No Pants Profit saying, hey, look, there's whole sections of the museum that aren't even open now. And that when you wear no pants, the only thing you got left to lose is your shirt. Have a great one. Bye.